Hello, 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 all. Um, uh, hello to all, everyone who is seeing um, this conference. Uh, I got really lucky. I have the pleasure and honor of presenting one of my favorite panels in this conference. Uh, let me first talk about the speakers. So, um, moderating the panel is Professor Vasanthar. He is the director for the PhD program in data science at NYU Stern. Uh, he's also the founder of SCT Capital Management his ML driven fund, his research addresses when we should trust AI systems with decision making and how digital platforms should be governed. He is an IT Delhi alumni, graduated in 1978 uh, with a BTEC in chemical engineering. He also has an MPhil and PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, joining him would be Dr. James Robinson, an economic and political scientist at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. He is widely recognized as the co-author of Why Nations Fought, the Origins of Power, Prosperity and Poverty. Currently an academic advisor at, to the World Bank's 2017 World Development Report on Governance, uh, James Robinson served on the board of the Global Development Network from January 2009 to December 2011 and on the Swedish Development po Policy Council, a committee advising the Swedish foreign minister on the Sweden's international development policy from 2007 to 10. His research focuses on the underlying causes of economic and political divergence and the relationships between political power and institutions and prosperity. They will also be accompanied by Paul Scheer. Paul is a senior research fellow at Musawar Rahmani Center for Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He previously held roles at SP Global as vice chairman, executive vice president, and chief economist as well, and served as the latter at Lehman Brothers in New York after. Um, earlier being Lehman's Asia Chief Economist and Head of Japan Equity Investments. He's a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on the New Economic Agenda and was a member of the WEF's Global Agenda Council on the International Monetary System uh, 2010 to 2012. He was appointed by two prime ministers to serve on committees of the Japanese government's Economic Deliberation Council. And he regularly attends and speaks at conferences around the world. This talk is titled Brave New World, which is also what Professor Dhar's podcast is named. Coincidence? Uh, no, not really. Both James and Paul have attended the podcast as guests. I would now like to welcome um, these speakers onto the stage and I'll hand it over to uh, Professor Dhar. Uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Uh, and I'm honored to be here as an IIT alum. Um, and ironically, um, you know, I became a fan of Aldous Huxley thanks to, you know, Brave New World that was assigned to us as one of two non-engineering books uh, when I was at the IIT, right? So that was, you know, the sort of humanities component <laughs> of, uh, of, of an engineering curriculum. So I've been, a, a, you know, a big fan of Huxley all along. Um, as of uh, Isaac Asimov, you know, I grew up sort of reading the Foundation series and, and pretty much everything Asimov wrote. Um, and Brave New World was actually motivated by what I saw as uh, an acceleration in the transformation of humanity post-COVID, uh, you know, driven by technology, driven by virtualization and new kinds of norms that I saw emerging in how we interact with each other. And this event is one such example. You know, I, I can't imagine uh, a few years ago contemplating, you know, a, a session like this where people just, you know, log in from all over the world, perhaps even, even in their pajamas, um, you know, and, and conducts a, conduct a session and then just go away. You know, not, not, not that any of us are wearing pajamas. Uh, we're all uh, dressed and set for this event. Um, so I've I've had the honor of having some amazing guests on my podcast. Uh, the last episode uh, that released yesterday had Danny Kahneman, uh, author of Thinking Fast and Slow, and I talked to him about his latest book called Noise, uh, which is all about you know what plagues human decision making, and, and it was a fascinating session. So I encourage you to tune in, as I do for the two sessions of my guests today. I had a fascinating discussion with Paul Sheard. Uh, 
uh, several months ago on understanding uh, QE, which I find a lot of people don't understand, including myself. Uh, and so he sort of really, um, you know, uh, illuminated this whole area of, about QE and how we should think about it. So I encourage you to tune into that. And um, last month I had James Robinson on the pod uh, talking about his book, The Narrow Corridor, which is a sort of a process a driven view of um, you know countries all around the world and the the balance or lack thereof uh, of power between state and society. Um, and it was that discussion that caused me to think a little bit more about the topic of this session, which is you know public private partnerships um, and and you know just historically and what they might look like in the sort of emerging digital era of the brave new world. Um, so I'd, I thought I'd start uh, and kick it off with James, uh, you know, before we get into sort of the meat of the discussion, which is public-private partnerships, just sort of lay the, uh, the groundwork in terms of, you know, uh, your sort of overall theory that you describe in the narrow corridor um, and in doing so, maybe you can sort of weave in some of the uh, key points uh, from why nations fail. Um, and, you know, that'll establish, sort of set the stage for uh, this, the discussion uh, to come. So, James, why don't you uh, take it away and just summarize your thoughts and theory? Okay. I mean, thank you. And thanks a lot for inviting me on, um, on, on, on this, to this event. Um, well, you know, why nations fail is really that was an attempt to sum up a lot of academic work that we'd done over the previous fifteen years on comparative economic development. What, why is it that some countries are rich and some countries are poor? And the explanation we give is, well, it's all about the the kind of economic institutions that countries create. It's not something which is God-given or determined by your latitude or your culture or anything else. It's the type of systems of rules that you set up and the patterns of incentives and opportunities those rules create. So, so in some sense, you know, you can illustrate the whole book, uh, you know, by looking at the Korean peninsula at night, you know, because if you look at the Korean peninsula at night, the south of Korea is extremely bright, of course, and the north is black, except for a little dot, you know, in the presidential compound in Pyongyang. And that difference in light at night represents, you know, differential use of technology, of course. Maybe the North Koreans don't have electricity, or maybe they have a lot of electricity, but they don't have any light bulbs, you know. One way or the other, you know, the south, all of that brightness represents technology and it represents enormous differences in living standards and prosperity, of course. And that, that's a very interesting picture because, first of all, that didn't exist 70 years ago. There was no such difference between North Korea and South Korea. And secondly, you know, it happens in the context of very similar cultures and histories. And so that can't be what's driving it. What's driving it, and you know, in some sense, it's what's very nice is that it's, it's obvious what's driving it. What dri what's driving it is in South Korea, they set up very different institutions, where they're creating very different patterns of incentives and opportunities. And North Korea blocked incentives and opportunities. They set up some Stalinist, centrally planned, regimented, controlled economy where nobody had incentives or opportunities except people at the top of the Communist Party. So it's not a book about socialism versus capitalism. It's a book about institutions and the incentives that institutions create. And so I think that I like that example, first of all, because everyone knows the answer. You already knew the answer to that. What you didn't know was that answer is the basis of a much more general explanation of comparative prosperity. And you also know that it's not enough to stop at economic institutions are different, the rules are incentives are different. But you have to push beyond that and ask why, you know, where did, why, you know, those rules were created by political institutions. And that's the next layer of the whole theory and there's a third layer which where I'll bring the next book in. So I'm doing I'm doing why nations fail in three minutes. So so then, okay. So 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 what do we we have some labels you know for this? We say economic institutions in South Korea were inclusive. You know they they 
created incentives and opportunity for a broad mass of people in society. In North Korea, economic institutions were extracted. You know, they were designed to control people, to channel resources to a narrow elite. What sort of politics creates inclusive economic institutions? And what sort of politics creates extractive economic institutions? And there, there's two components of that. Inclusive economic institutions emerge when you have inclusive political institutions, where we emphasize both broad-based distribution of political power and a strong state. And in some sense, extractive economic institutions emerge when either of those two things fail. In the North Korean case, you could say the state is pretty strong, actually. It's pretty capable of organizing and regulating. But obviously, political power is narrowly concentrated in the hands of the Communist Party. So, so the first book, Why Nations Failed, develops that theory and it applies it in lots of different contexts. But, you know, you could ask the question, okay, so then rich countries in the world have these inclusive economic institutions underpinned by inclusive political institutions and poor countries don't. And poor countries could be, you know, Colombia or Zimbabwe or North Korea or Uzbekistan. They all have extractive institutions. But why does the world look like that? You know, how come the world got divided into places with inclusive institutions and extractive institutions? That's a very deeply historical question. And in Why Nations Fail, you get kind of vignettes about that. And the narrow corridor is much more about trying to develop, as, as, as Vasant said, you know, trying to develop a kind of process theory, trying to understand the historical dynamics that created inclusive societies in some places and not in other places. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that uh, summary, James. Um, Paul, what's your take as an economist on this role and the balance of power between state, society, uh, trusted institutions. Uh, and, and a sub-question there, by the way, uh, is, you know, did America and Western Europe sort of just get lucky? Um, <laughs> or was it sort of just more than that? It's wow. a question I've asked James previously, but I'll ask you that this time. Right, right. Well, let me uh, let me see if I can get to that second question eventually. Um, it's a difficult one. Uh, well, first of all, let me again uh, thank you, the organisers, and and you, Vasant, um, for inviting me to this uh, very interesting and prestigious panel at this Pan IIT World of Technology Conference. And congratulations on pulling off the technological feat of of, of uh, running this conference. Um, and it's a pleasure and honor to be uh, sharing the stage with such distinguished colleagues. Um, yeah, so maybe just starting you know, as an economist, and you know, I think James is an economist and a political scientist. I'm just an economist, but uh, you know, at the sort of the, the confession or the mea culpa up front, um, although I'll go on to absolve myself a little bit, is that economists uh, typically, uh, economics as a subject, has never really focused very much, certainly in most of its development, on the role of institutions. It's been something that's come in as a little bit of a side story. Um, and that's something that, you know, economists are often uh, an ec economics kind of criticised for, that, you know, too focused on this abstract idea of a market and the role of the government or the state is kind of relegated to a very subsidiary role. Now, that's really a stereotype, but, uh, you know, it's, it's it probably broad brush correct. Um, I've, as an economist myself, um, I've always been interested in institutions. It was actually an interest in the more micro-level institutions and how did the Japanese subcontracting system work in the automobile industry? That was my piece, first piece of research. And, you know, why is it different from, say, the US uh, or Europe? And um, why does it seem to perform better? And that, that issue sort of became writ large with... Uh, you know, in the 1980s in particular, when you know, Japan rose and it was Japan as number one. And there was a lot of uh, discussion around well, what is the secret source that Japan seems to have in terms of its rapid uh, economic development. Um, so I've kind of worked in this broad area of sort of comparative institutional analysis, um, uh, you know, for, for a long time and very interested in these institutional issues. Um, so I need to get to uh, James's second book. I've got his first book, uh, The uh, Why Nation, uh, Nations Fail, but I haven't got the narrow corridor yet. So that's definitely uh, will be next on my reading list. Let me just start a little bit um, 
you know, at, at the broadest level, when we talk about public-private uh, partnerships or the, the role of the state versus the market, um, you know, I think you could, at the, at the broadest level, kind of argue that the whole economy or the whole society is a public-private uh, partnership. Um, again, even if you picked up an introductory economics textbook, you, you, you'd be looking at in the micro chapters would be all around, around about the role of markets and consumer theory and you know how how efficient markets are. But there would there would be a passing comment and observation that you know markets really need the government to exist, particularly to secure property rights and keep the peace. Um, but that's sort of then you pass on. But that's so the role of government is acknowledged. If you get to the macro chapters, uh, then you'll learn about aggregate demand and that sometimes the whole macro economy can fall into uh, a recession. And then you, you know, there's a huge debate about what is the, the appropriate role of the government in helping the economy to get back to full employment. So you have Keynesian economics, you have monetarism, and then you have some people who say, well, there's no role for government, but they're very much a fringe. Um, I don't know, maybe James has a few colleagues at the University of Chicago who would minimise <laughs> the role of government. Um, but there is, even in, in, in the introductory te economics textbook, a, a re recognition that the whole economic system and society is a public-private um, partnership. But you know, economists will choose to focus very much on the market side of things um, and you know just even even at a, 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 a broader brush level when you think about this economists like to talk about the different sectors of the economy and that can be a very useful sort of framework the, there's the household sector the consumer sector if you like there's the business sector uh, the production sector, there's the government sector, and then there's the overseas sector when you bring in international trade. So you have these different sectors, but of course, um, the government and then the corporate sector are sort of, you know, institutions, they're, they're, they're ways of organising uh, individuals. So at the, at the ultimate reduced level of the economy, of course, all we have are the individuals, but we wear, wear these different hats and we participate in different parts of the economy, sometimes as consumers, sometimes as government workers, certainly as citizens who vote and participate in the political process. So again, at that sort of level of the tapestry of the way in which the economy and the, and the political system sort of weave themselves together, this sort of bright line separation of the, the market or the private economy on one side and the public and the government on the other side, um, you know, useful for analytical purposes, but it is a gross uh, simplification. Um, so, we, you know, we, we have both, we need both. And when you start thinking about the different uh, areas of the economy, um, you can see that mixture of public and private pretty much in any topic that you would wish to pick up, you know, the education system, we have private parts, we have public parts, um, the military, obviously, uh, even though that seems to be very government, um, you know, we keep hearing in the US in particular about all the government contractors. And I think I heard a statistic the other day that there are actually more government contractors in Afghanistan than there were military. So you had the public and the private on the ground, you know, uh, fighting wars. Um, you mentioned my interest in quantitative easing and monetary affairs. When you look at the monetary system or the fiscal system, you see the same thing, this deep intermeshing of, of private and public around these established institutions. Um, so monetary system, for example, banks are responsible, you know, and banks are typically, although they don't have to be, private actors, but banks are responsible for the creation of most of the money that's in the economic system. Um, but if you get a loan from a bank and then you take the money out of the bank, you've just changed a liability of a private bank into a liability of the Federal Reserve, which is part of the government. Um, and of course, banks themselves are tied into the Federal Reserve system. So the point there being that, again, if you're looking at the banking system and the monetary system, it is this interwoven public and private partnership, if you like, or institutional framework. Look at fiscal policy. You think, well, the fiscal policy must be much more about just the government sort of spending money and running deficits. Um, but of course, the government has to inject that money into something, which is the private sector economy, and typically withdraws that money, some of that money by taxing and also by issuing bonds. 
And of course, government bonds become the basis of the, the term structure of interest rates or the yield curve. And the yield curve is the whole fulcrum around which financial markets price and operate. So again, we see this interweaving of, of the two. So you know, I think I've said enough to, to make that basic point that it's, it's kind of more complicated spaghetti than sometimes might be realized. Um, so then the question really starts to become, well, you know, what, what is the appropriate kind of mixture of these things? And what are the sort of, uh, where's the comparative advantage of the market versus the comparative advantage of government? And, you know, I think, again, a lot of this stuff will, you'll find in basic uh, textbooks, but economists, again, very simply would talk about, well, there are market failures. And that's when you have the need for, for the government or the public side of the public private partnership. Um, it is instructive that economists will start already assuming the market. And then when they start to figure out why do we need government, they start looking at ways in which the government fails. Uh, sorry, the market fails, which leads to the need for government. You could start at the other end, potentially. Um, but obviously, you know, externalities, the supply of public goods, uh, law and order, enforcing contracts, all of those kind of things, uh, you the market is not necessarily good at those. And the government, of course, uh, also has failures. And particularly, and this might eventually link into the digitalization discussion, Vasant, um, you know, one of the most influential economists in critiquing the, the role of the government. Why wouldn't you have a bigger government? Government is very good at organizing collective action, so su supplying public goods. Uh, ameliorating externalities. Also, perhaps worth noting, is the market is very good at generating prosperity and wealth and production of goods and services and providing what sometimes called high-powered incentives. But um, the market is not very good or very agnostic almost to the issue of redistributing wealth. Um, and that's something that the government obviously has a very big role of dis redistributing wealth, uh, which is, again, is a kind of form of society acting collectively to um, make sure that purchasing power is, is distributed better than the market would, would do, and also providing uh, safety nets. But the big thing that I was going to mention, uh, Frederick Hayek, of course, is he talked a lot and pointed out that the, the government is not very good as an information processing system. And what the market economy does and the price system does very well is very efficiently uses information uh, and you know, in, in a very decentralized fashion. And that's really the marvel, the marvel of the market. So it's always this balancing act uh, but between the, the two. So that's just more kind of setting the stage in terms of the framework of how I would think about these things. So, so where do institutions come in? Um, Institutions, which can, of course, be government institutions or private sector institutions, and, of course, typically they kind of have elements of both. Um, you know, again, a really an important uh, aspect of the economy that economists still, I don't think, are altogether comfortable with. But it's really, um, you know, codifying the rules of the game, rules of interaction, and establishing sort of norms of behaviour, which then sort of, in some sense, people... You know, every generation doesn't have to re-establish or start the institutions from scratch. They can take those institutions as given and operate within them. Um, but that presupposes that those institutions actually are good institutions uh, and they work well. And I guess that sort of brings to um, your much more difficult question, Vasant, which I'll probably punt to a large extent. Uh, you know, was it just path dependence? Uh, that is sort of, you know, serendipity of, of history that led some of these countries to, you know, the Industrial Revolution to start in, uh, in, in the UK, in Britain, um, or was it something... Was it, was it something else? Was it, was it about the institutions that those countries had? They were in the right place with the right institutional structure at the right time. Um, that's a really difficult question. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll punt that one back to James, I think. <laughs> but um, I think the, the bottom line is, you know, institutions do matter. When I look at this question that, that motivates James's research of, you know, and again, I think economists, other than, than James and his co-author and, and, and a few others, have not really grappled with this well enough, um, is when you do look around the world, why is it 
that certain countries have, even if they miss that first uh, you know, train to leave the station. Um, they were able to catch up, get on that escalator and move up. And I'm thinking particularly of the East Asian countries, Japan, the Tigers, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Southeast Asia. And then you had, of course, China. And I think, you know, India, you know, I was just looking at India's growth rate uh, last 20 years or so has averaged about 7%. Um, you know, it really should be 10%, but it's certainly a lot better than the three or four percent that it used to be. So what what explains that? Um, the one variable that I've always kind of focused on is is the investment in human capital. That uh, the norms, the institutions, the culture, call it whatever you like. Where the- that was that was pretty amazing. I'm going to have to go back and listen to this uh, <laughs> segment again. There was there was a lot you threw in there. Uh, but that's but this is a great segue, uh, you know, back to James um, to sort of pick up on on some of the points you made about you know what are the comparative advantages of uh, you know the state versus market society. So James, do you want to like pick up on this and and talk, I guess, historically about uh, you know successful private public partnerships and where we are now. Uh, especially in the context of, you know, Biden's new infrastructure bill, you know, is that a sort of new um, example of uh, public-private partnerships? So take, take take it back a little bit, put things in historical context, and then let's see where we are today. Yeah, I mean, it, it might be. It, you know, I mean, I don't talk very much about markets. You know, I tend to I tend to I tend to describe myself as a recovering economist. You know, because because you know, my, all my work is in the developing world you know and and when you're trying to understand why things don't work in the democratic republic of congo or colombia or haiti i i just never found like what i'd learned at P- grad school and at london school of economics i, I just didn't find it uh, it explained anything so I, I had to kind of completely like reinvent myself to to find concepts and ideas that that did seem to explain a little bit not that i pretend to understand any of those countries um, so, so, so I, you know, so, so I, I'm not going to talk too much about markets actually, because the, what we talk about much more is about power and how power is distributed in society, and you know what kind of institutions get created as a result of that power. You know, the institutions get created maybe to perpetuate your power or to stop other people gaining power, or perhaps to create wealth too, because you know people have materialistic interests and you know when we talk when i was talking earlier about you know how is it that where did these inclusive institutions come from that's about how power is distributed in society in some sense and i think there is a lot of idiosync a lot of idiosyncrasy in how power gets distributed you know historical events can empower certain groups in society and and you know and then there's an enormous amount of path dependence. So, so you know, so if we, you, you know, you re- you asked, you know, you articulated the question, you know, why did the industrial revolution happen in in England or Western Europe? You know, I would say, well, that's because they developed inclusive, much more inclusive institutions than anyone had ever done historically. I mean, you can find pockets of inclusion wherever you look. You know, like classical Athens or the Central Valley of you know, Oaxaca, you know, in the pre-Columbian period or whatever. So let me not go into that. But 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 this was, you know, these were very inclusive by world historical standards. And that created all sorts of incentives and opportunities that stimulated entrepreneurship and innovation and develop of co- development of corporate forms and development of markets and trade and mercantile activities, all sorts of things. So so we kind of see that as something which flows from the institution. Once you get the institutions right, you know, then then all of that stuff is going to happen. So so our focus is much more on the institutions rather than all that other stuff. Even though obviously that's very important, and economists, you know, but like one of the places that you know Asimoglu and I started on this thirty years ago was well, economists understand extremely well, you know, what creates economic growth. It's investment in education and innovation and capital accumulation and public goods. And so why the heck, you know, when it's so well known and every economist agrees you know why on earth isn't everyone doing it you know there's there must be some explanation for that it's not there aren't incentives because look at what happened in east asia you know if you start doing the right thing 
the economy explodes at 10% a year. You know, it's not like you have to wait very long for the prosperity. So it's not just about impatience, which was sort of the canonical theory when I was a graduate student. There's got to be something else going on here. And, you know, my whole career has been sort of searching for what else has been going on. So, so, so how did these institutions emerge in Western Europe? And why did they emerge in Western Europe, you know, and not in China or India or somewhere else? You know, well, that, as I, you know, in, in the narrow corridor provides this very simple way of thinking about that. And it's about the balance of power between the state and society and how that comes to sort of gel in a particular way and how it reproduces itself. So without going into all the details, you know, if I thought if, you know, if you asked me about Western Europe, why did the Industrial Revolution happen in Western Europe? I'd say, well, you have to go back to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. And at the end of the Roman, Western Roman Empire, the Western Europe was overrun by these Germanic tribes. And what's interesting about the Germanic tribes is they had this incredibly participatory political system. So the tribes were organized around these assemblies and very democratic practices. And then what the Merovingians did was to fuse these very participatory political institutions with late Roman state institutions, administrative institutions, the church, uh, fiscal institutions, not quite so well, judicial institutions. You know, they had, suddenly they could read and write and they could write laws and promulgate the Salic Code. And, but they merged that in a brilliant way with these very participatory political institutions. And, and to me, that's like the pivotal moment that sets Western Europe off on a very different dynamic from China, for example, where that moment never happened, you know, uh, or India, you know, where things were, I could talk about India if you want, but, you know, so, of course, then you're thinking, oh my gosh, but, you know, that's 500, you know, that's 500 AD, the Industrial Revolution didn't start until 1770 or something. Well, that's where the process comes in, you know, you don't just build in modern institutions overnight, there's a process, there's a, we call this the Red Queen effect, the process where, where the state is trying to control society. You know, maybe King Clovis, who set this system up, didn't really like all this participation and he wanted to get it under control. But then society fights with the state and the state fights with society. So, so there's this, this is the process. You know, there's a dynamic where the state develops and society develops. And that's what builds kind of inclusive institutions. But that that can always topple over. And I think what I find interesting, and we discussed this in the US chapter, and, and I think this, you know, this private sector defense contracting thing is a brilliant example, is that, is that you know, private public partnerships are sort of a way of maybe institutionalizing in a healthy way this competition between the state and society, because there's always the danger of the state becoming too strong or, or the society becoming too strong. Uh, this summer, I was doing research in Nigeria, for example, for a month. I'm working with a lot of uh, scholars at the University of Nigeria in Nsuka. And I was staying in my friend, this one of my friend's villages in the east of Nigeria. And like that village is totally self-organizing. The federal government does nothing. There's no employee of the federal government. They provide security. They provide public goods. You need a school. You collect money. You know, you need street lighting. You collect money. The government does nothing. And the government, no, they don't expect or want anything from the federal government of Nigeria. So that's not that's not a situation where this competition is going on at all. They're completely isolated from the government. You know, they hate the government. They don't want anything to do with the government. So there's no competition. The state isn't trying to control them. They're not trying to control the state. So that dynamic, you know, that got going in Western Europe doesn't work in Nigeria. It's so completely broken. And so, you know, so it's difficult to manage this thing. But I think the public-private partnerships is a very interesting way of doing this, you know, because... You know, why? Let me give you the example of Snowden, Edward Snowden, for example. You know, what was going on there? All of this new technology suddenly allowed the state to kind of monitor and control society in a way that had never been technologically feasible before. What was Snowden doing? Snowden was working for a contractor, working for the government. That's a private-public partnership. He was working for a contractor. What did he do? He blew the whistle. That's actually great. That's a good thing. That's the system working. It's society trying to keep the state under control. If everyone had been working for the state, 
it would have been much more difficult. They're more dependent on the state. They're less autonomous from the state. It's more difficult to criticize and push against the state. So the way I look at that is that's actually the system working. It's like that public-private system kind of allowed Snowden to feel he wasn't part of the state. He was part of society. And it gave him the courage and the sort of vision to say, this is terrible. You know, I'm going to complain about this and I'm going to tell the world. So I think that's an example of public-private partnership helping create this equilibrium between the state and society and this balance, because that's what you need you know, to get these inclusive institutions. That's the argument. So let's talk about India, right? You, and in fact, you have a chapter in your book, I think it's called The Broken Red Queen, if I remember correctly, or something similar. Uh, so what's, you know, how come India just sort of keeps getting its own, in its own way, if I were to sort of put it really bluntly? What, what, what's, uh, what's preventing the train from really leaving the station? Yeah, I think, I mean, the way, you know, the, the, the title of that chapter, The Broken Red, Red Queen, is ref- we use this expression, the Red Queen effect, to talk about this competition between state and society. So you sort of, you both have to run to stand still to keep this balance. And so, and society has to change. You know, society has to change. If you look at, you know, the history of society in, say, my own country, England, you know, what you see is society, you know, goes from being very isolated to much more connected to having collective ideas in common and collective imaginaries and creates institutions and associations so it can organize at large scale. And, you know, so society develops as the state develops. You know, the state development might be, you know, more obvious development of fiscal systems or administration or bureaucracy or, you know, ability to monitor society and collect information and, you know, the start the census or whatever. But I think so the point in the Indian case, I mean, India is sort of fascinating. I mentioned China in the sense that if you look at Chinese history, you see that there was never this moment, you know, the Merovingians where institutions of accountability got fused with state institutions. There's absolutely no history of accountability or representation in China until you you have to go right back, you know, into the Warring States period or the Autumn and Springs period before the start of the first dynasty. But in India, you have lots of that. You know, you have enormous history of accountability and representation. You go back to the time of the Buddha in the north of India, there's evidence of extremely participatory politics. So, so why, doesn't that, why doesn't that coalesce into this red queen effect working? And the, and the argument we give is the caste system. It's really the caste system because if, if you look at societies with inclusive institutions where society changes as the state changes, that is blocked in India by the caste system. You know, we were, I was, I've been very influenced by reading Ambedkar's writings about the, class, the caste system and the impact of the caste system on Indian society. And it's that division of people, you know, division of people into castes, into different occupations. It keeps society very fragmented and divided against itself. Everybody wants to, you know, maintain its position by keeping everybody else in their, in their position, as Ambedkar puts it. And that stops this development of society taking place. It stops society becoming stronger and more dynamic in the way we talk about in the book. So I would say that's the fundamental, you know, you could think of straightforward economic reasons why the caste system would lead to terrible misallocation of talent and resources, obviously. But our emphasis is much more on, you can't create this dynamic that really creates a state, you know, which is powerful. So it gets, the state and society gets kind of blocked. So it, India doesn't have the type of society to really, it's not really an inclusive society, but, but that, that's kind of obvious if I talk about the caste system. But what's more interesting from our perspective or more new is the impact of that on this, this dynamic with the state. So that's, uh, th- thanks for that, uh, uh, James. I'm, I'm going to come back to that in, in just a few minutes, but I want to give Paul a chance to weigh in uh, just about India. So if you want to add anything, Paul, uh, to what James has just said, sort of from a, you know, markets and economy standpoint as to, you know, what, you know, what, what, what are the barriers uh, as far as India is concerned? Why does it see, sort of keep getting in, it, in its own way? I, my, I mean, my first went to India in 1975, um, 
just to kind of benchmark myself here. And and then I you know, went back, I guess, in the 1990s and 2000s in a, in a more professional capacity. Um, that, you know, you just land in India and you are kind of like assaulted. Your senses are assaulted. Um, it's this land of, it, it's got incredible vibrancy, but it's also a kind of like this, almost this chaotic feel to it. So, you know, I think it's, and then you go to China and you see a, a, a much more kind of, you know, regimented, orderly, you know, everybody kind of is, it, it's almost, I mean, this is not a great metaphor, but almost like a giant anthill. But you get the point of everybody is feverishly sort of running around and they've, 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 the, they've got their place in the system. And if you can sort of, if you look at what happened in China, I mean, you know, obviously it has a checkered history, but, you know, the critical moment, I guess, in the modern history was Deng Xiaoping, 1979, uh, you know, basically embracing kind of markets and, and, and helping to unleash market forces into an economy that had this sort of natural order built into it, you know, thinking of the, you know, today 90 million members of the Communist Party of, of China. So they didn't have to worry about, and this maybe I don't know how this fits into James's paradigm, but they didn't have to worry about messy things like, you know, elections and opposition parties and contestability. They channeled that sort of political contestability, you know, through this Communist Party of, uh, of China, which I don't think is, a, it's not correct to think of it as some sort of dictatorship, but rather as uh, an internalized kind of tournament where people rise through the ranks, but they have to be sort of, in some sense, acting in the broader public interest. And there's this sort of social contract between the people uh, and, 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 and the rulers that, you know, that growth will, will be delivered and everybody will do their part. So that's more about China than, than India. In some sense, China is easy to talk about as an economist uh, than, than India is um, because of that internal complexity and perhaps at a national level, less um, kind of coherence and identity as you know, a single country that is, you know, has a single kind of mission, economic development, and then from the top, you know, has the right um, kind of, I don't know, enlightened guidance about what kind of institutional frameworks do you need to put in place? Because, again, in getting back to the role of the government versus the market, the market will deliver prosperity. It will deliver innovation. It will deliver growth. But it does need the right institutional framework in order to do that. And it's not really the job of the market uh, or the private sector necessarily to provide that institutional framework. That's more the job of the government and the, and the state. So, you know, I don't, I'm not an expert on, on, on India. Um, I, I do tend to be more on the bullish side when I look at India, because it does have this 20 year history now of significant economic growth. It has, um, the English language, which is an advantage, you know, it has the democracy, the biggest democracy in the world. Now, again, you know, listening to James, you know, can that start to become a positive driver for India because you've got that, the, 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 the society being kind of represented and, and holding uh, the state accountable, um, but it doesn't seem to have worked necessarily in that way up to date. But, may, but one of the things that strikes me with this whole discussion thus on, and this whole big debate about comparative economic development and, and everything else is that things that in initial conditions and path dependence has been mentioned a few times, but things that seem to work um, in certain periods Turn to fail, tend to fail in others, um, and you know why that is, is is probably a very difficult issue. But you know, again, if you take Japan for example, um, I, I mentioned uh, before in the nineteen eighties, you know, Japan became kind of this you know economy that was going to take over the whole world. And, you know, it was almost like being on the front cover of The Economist or Time magazine. The moment that everybody, you know, outside Japan started to focus on Recording Japan. Recording stopped. Say, wow. Japan is number one. Um, they're going to take over the world. Of course, Japan entered a sort of a relative decline. And what was fascinating to me as somebody working as an academic sort of in that literature at the time, you know, you rapidly saw people 
pointing to the very institutional factors that had been invoked as Japan's secret of success, now they were the source of the failure. So I think that's an interesting question of, of when do these institutions sort of find their moment in the sun? And, and, and it may well be that, you know, India is, is going to move into that space, you know, over, over coming years, but it's a, it's a, you know, it's a fascinating and a very complicated uh, economy and society. You know, it's, uh, I, I was struck by your phrase that, you know, what was Japan's secret sauce? Um, and I asked myself the same thing, uh, you know, could India have a secret sauce? You know, because you mentioned that some of the ingredients certainly seem to exist, right? There's participation, you know, governments get thrown out of power routinely, um, uh, you know, so the, the, the basis for, you know, a, a strong, vibrant, balanced society does seem to exist. What could this secret sauce be? And I'm sort of now segueing into sort of the digital era, right, mm -hmm. where I see some hope, right? I mean, I, I, I see India sort of taking some steps, um, almost as, you know, uh, as having sort of a late mover advantage, right? So the internet and, and sort of the digital infrastructure in the US, you know, developed rather quickly. Um, you know, big tech essentially took over. Uh, we've had books like Surveillance Capitalism, which are critiques on sort of the American society at the moment that we are actually being surveilled by, you know, a small handful of private companies. Um, India seems to have taken sort of a more measured approach to sort of the digital uh, age, um, you know, we've seen this sort of large scale biometric, you know, identity as a service kind of a, a capability that's come out of India. Um, you know, for sure, there have been concerns about it, potential for abuse. But for the most part, it seems to have actually been successful in facilitating inclusion, right? Because mm -hmm. 600 million P Indians yep. didn't even have an identity, right? So, uh, so in that sense, it seems to me that there's, there's hope, you know, and, and, and you talked about that, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that it hasn't happened in India, but it will. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm just wondering whether can, that's potentially where the yep. secret sauce might actually lie. Can I, can I just jump back in there before we're going to James? Just, yeah, I, no, I think that's it. And that was sort of the, um, the basis of my sort of guarded optimism about, about India is, uh, and, you know, I remember being in Japan, oh, sorry, India, India a few years back and uh, visiting government offices and hearing from some of the senior officials about the JAM program and they were explaining it to me. And I nearly fell off my seat um, because I hadn't realised, you, know, it, 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 you know, it sounded aspirational. This is, of course, everybody on this call, I, I guess, knows, but maybe the podcast listeners eventually, um, this JAM uh, kind of program is, as I understand it, uh, that the three initials stand for sort of the financial inclusion, everybody getting a bank account or access to bank accounts, the identity system, the uh, uh, ad, ADHA system, if, if I got the pronunciation right, where everybody has a, a, a biometric identity and a 12-digit sort of number, and then the mobile using the, the mobile te technology. So you've, you've got the ability putting those three things together to kind of leapfrog and go to the to the technological um, boundary. And suddenly, you know, villages in a remote part of India, you know, have got their mobile phones, they've got their, uh, you know, access to, to finance, their bank account, and they're able to become digital citizens. And it sort of just suddenly, you know, I mean, this is the power of the internet, opens up the whole world. I mean, this, these devices that we now take for granted, you know, just incredible, empowering devices, um, if you can use them in the, in the right way. And then, of course, when you talk, IT, I mean, India is almost the first thing that, that pops into your mind. And then the other element with India, which I, it plays into here, I think, is the diaspora. Um, and, you know, many IIT graduates will probably go on and, you know, they'll be 10, 15 years working for McKinsey or, uh, you know, Google or, or, or any other number of companies uh, in America and around the world. But that is a very, um, the, the ability of India to tap into its elite high tech, both in the, the tech side, but also in the sort of the managerial side, the consulting side, and bring that knowledge back into uh, India, I think is a, is a really powerful potential lever. And I may have my facts wrong, but 
I understood from my conversations in India at the time that um, the you know, major consultants had been quite instrumental. I'm not sure if it was McKinsey or who it was, but quite instrumental in maybe uh, some of the other big, big, uh, big names in getting that whole jam thing kind of, you know, off the, the the concept board and and into the economy. So yes, I do think in a nutshell, in terms of the next phase of. India's growth. And, and, and the other thing is an economist looking at India, I look at China and, you know, China's moved you know, 20, 30 years ahead of China. The flip side of that is that India has got still tremendous economic development potential. If you look at per capita GDP, it's still quite low. It's um, in PPP basis, China's about almost three times as much as India in nominal terms. It's more than five times India's per capita GDP. But if you flip that on its head, that tells you that there's tremendous economic development left in, in India. But it's all about, again, getting the institutions right, getting that public-private sector interaction partnerships right, and harnessing uh, you know, the, the, the IT capabilities in particular. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, we've uh, actually moved into the Q&A uh, um, part of the session. But before we do that, I just want to let... Uh, James weigh in again on this whole public-private partnerships and digital. Um, uh, James, yeah, I don't know. I, let me disagree with two things Paul said. So, first of all, I really disagree with this characterization of what's going on in China. There's no social contract in China. There's a hideous dictatorship. If there was a social contract, the Chinese wouldn't be needing to use all their information technology to create a social credit system to monitor everybody and repress millions of people in Central Asia. You know, it's a personalized dictatorship. Sure, they didn't need to, Deng Xiaoping didn't need to consult the people, you know, to change course. And they didn't need to consult the people to launch the Great Leap Forward either, or the Cultural Revolution, murdering tens of millions of people. I think if you look at Chinese history, you see that they do not have a sustainable model of political institutions to underpin this. I think, you know, yes. Part of the story in China is a movement from very extractive economic institutions in the 1970s to much more inclusive economic institutions. And then all the sort of stuff, you know, happens that economists love. But the whole point of why nations fail is that's not sustainable without political institutions that are also inclusive. And China doesn't have that. So, so you know, so my view is that China does not have a sustainable model of economic growth at all, and it's all going to end in a very ugly way. You know, so just to say, my second, my second observation is, you know, so, so I think this thing about technology is really fascinating. You know, this, this whether or not the enormous innovations in technology and these kind of things that Paul was talking about in India can really move India onto a different path, a different trajectory, can kind of perturb its equilibrium in some way. But I guess I'm also skeptical about that. You know, my view and you know is that technology doesn't have any kind of implication. It all just depends on how it's used. And how it's used it is determined by politics and by institutions. And you know, the example I always like to give is the rate the invention of the radio, you know. So when the radio was invented in the United and it disseminated in the 1930s in, you know, in the United States, everyone started getting a radio and stuff. What you see, if you look in a detailed way at the data, is when people started getting radios, the government had to pay attention to them. So policy became much more sort of sensitive to like ordinary people. Suddenly radio spread, that empowered people, the government had to do more stuff, you know, they had to pay attention, they had to provide things people want. It was a great thing. At the same time, Hitler was buying, was giving everybody a radio so they could listen to his speeches. You know, so what's the difference between those two things? Well, Hitler controlled what was on the radio, and in the United States, that the government didn't control what was on the radio. So, so I think like that's a simple example of the technology is identical. You know, it's spreading and diffusing at the same time, but it has radically different consequences because of who controls it and what their incentives are and what the politics is. So, so I. You know, so that that's kind of my my take on all of this. <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, James. This makes me think about our conversation several years ago, uh, where you know, uh, and it was in Goa, where I actually said, "Isn't China sort of a counter example to your theory?" You know, that is, isn't that an example of you know lack of institutions, lack of participation, 
but uh, you know, an, an incredibly successful, well, I shouldn't say incredibly successful, but a society that seems to have, or a country that seems to have gotten its act together, at least economically. Uh, so it's interesting that you're, that you're making this sort of long-term bet against China that, you know, that things will just sort of end badly because it doesn't, uh, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm agnostic about that. You know, I, uh, you know, on the one hand, I see, uh, you know, tremendous progress, uh, you know, um, the average Chinese citizen actually seems quite happy because their lives are tremendously more, are richer than, you know, those of the previous generation. So it, in one sense, it seems to be working for them, but I do get this feeling, that this uneasy feeling that uh, things might end badly, but it's interesting to see that you're willing to sort of make that bet. Yeah, I mean, when I was an undergraduate, we were taught that if you really wanted to be successful economically, you had to have a model like the Soviet Union. You know, in the 1960s and 1970s, every economist, Nobel Prize winning economist, the CIA, everybody convinced themselves that the Soviet Union was going to overtake the United States. You know, every economics textbook, undergraduate economics textbook, had a picture of Soviet GDP overtaking the US, you know, and it was true, you know, from the mid 1920s. For 50 years, the Soviet Union, we know, was one of the world's most successful experiences of industrialization. Economic historians wrote books about it, and everybody fooled themselves. And now, you know, you tell students that, they sort of laugh at you, you know, that no one remembers, you know, but you, you're all old enough. You're as old as me, probably. So, 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 so you're old, you know, like, I think that's a very salutary example to remind ourselves of. You know, there's many experiences of transitory were, you know, growth in history that have kind of not really been based, have been based on being in the right place at the right time, like Argentina, you know, for 50 years before the First World War, they're sitting on this incredibly productive land, commodity prices are booming, you don't have to do much to kind of, you know, it's the same with the China, you know, the Chinese are sort of have these incredibly low wages, they have this sort of docile, you know, people who can be controlled, there's this enormous opportunity, you know, for expansion internationally and globally, and it's happened many times in world history. So um, I'll just uh, throw open this to either of you. Uh, uh, James, you know, you mentioned technology and uh, Paul and I sort of on the side have been having this discussion about the fact that at least in the US, technology sort of now makes up half the economy. Um, what are the, you know, and, and I, I'm sort of uh, somewhat bullish on sort of the Indian approach to you know, managing digital infrastructure and creating, you know, what, what they call a private digital infrastructure. I, I haven't heard that term come out of anywhere else. Um, and that, you know, identity as a service is, uh, you know, part of that public digital infrastructure. Payments will be, you know, part of this public digital infrastructure, which I view as sort of digital utilities. Do any of you want to comment uh, on why this sort of new um, evolution in technology is different from the previous one and what the opportunities and risks might be um, in this, um, you know, progression to sort of a more digital future. Do either of you want to uh, comment on that? <laughs> yeah, it's a, well, that's a, that's a it's a, a a big question um i mean let me let me just maybe approach it maybe a, answer maybe a different question but maybe but as a way of getting at it is is really how is you know how is digitalization um you know changing uh this you know this the nature of these sort of partnerships between the the, the private and the public sector what are the implications of all this digitalization um for that and and you know i think this is it's a kind of fascinating um topic i think in in some sense i mean what we've definitely seen is the technology and the digital economy just like you know going ahead and leaps and bounds and at a kind of frenetic kind of rate rate and really going sort of well beyond the uh, the ability of the the state if you like or the, the government or, the, or the, the public sphere to really kind of get their hands around it and and, and sort of regulate it and, and establish the rules of the road and you know, were talking about the infrastructure package the the 3.5 trillion dollar infrastructure package before touched on that a little bit what one of the fascinating things sort of 
in looking at the US and looking at sort of infrastructure here um, is that when you look at the physical infrastructure, you know, the, the, the bridges and the, the, the subway systems and the, uh, the airports and, and much of the physical infrastructure, uh, even the roads and potholes and the, the resilience of the physical infrastructure or lack thereof to, you know, stress events like we just had the Ida hurricane um, in, in the US. Um, you know, it looks it looks very bad and fragile. I think the the American Society of Engineers famously has a, like a D rating or something on the quality of the infrastructure. So that three point five trillion dollar package, you know, is getting you know, putting aside the actual you know what's in the making of that sausage, what's actually in there, you know, big picture seems to be something that is really needed. But while this sort of lack of infrastructure, uh, and of course China and, and other countries, East Asia in particular. Uh, maybe even India catching up now, have, have been building much better sort of first-class uh, infrastructure while the US infrastructure has been decaying. When we look at the IT world, you know, there has been this infrastructure boom, which is the whole you know, laying of the of the uh, the infrastructure, the internet and the information economy um, and all the connectivity that we have and all the software that and the apps and, and, and everything else. That's stuff that we don't actually see, but we use and it's there. So that's really going ahead and, and shifting the, the boundary very, very quickly. Um, it seemed to me that Again, getting back to what is the government good at and what is the private sector good at? So what's the best kind of nature of that partnership? What the government or the state need, you know, needs to be doing is, is really kind of taking a step back and, and, and trying to set the rules of the road. And what are the rules of the road? What are the right institutions uh, that we need to have in place around data protection, you know, ownership of data? Um, is it something that just your data goes into the public sphere and that's what drives the platform economy? Or, or is it something that the individual, you know, should and can have some kind of, you know, control over? Um, you know, how do you protect the critical infrastructure? Again, which is increasingly virtual infrastructure, cyber security, cyber risks. Um, and then there's also issues of, which is a little bit of a different category of sort of income distribution. One of the things about the, the, um, the, the sort of information economy, the digital era, is again, because of these kind of network effects and these platform economies or platform companies, is that you have you know, these winner take all wealth effects on steroids um and you know every now and again i take a look at these numbers but uh you know my top five you know jeff bezos uh net uh, uh, net worth 198 billion dollars mark zuckerberg 133 dollars sergey brin 118 larry page 130 123 and bill gates 120 132, that adds up to more than $700 billion net wealth of just five individuals. And of course, there's a lot of trickle down from that group in those companies to the top, you know, a few thousand people that are working there. If you look at the market cap of those, uh, those companies, you were talking about, you know, one to two trillion uh, aggregate for five, four companies is just a little bit over $7 trillion now. So, you know, that is a role for government. Now, how they do it is another issue that's very complicated, but the role of government in making sure that while this innovation is being unleashed, and of course, all of that market cap value is essentially discounting, you know, the future revenue, which has got to come from satisfied customers. So it's not a simple thing of like, we've got to somehow expropriate that wealth. But the this digital revolution, call it what you like, is is upending society from that point of view as well. But I think the again the the it's it's more I think that the government needs to become more focused on the kind of software. I don't mean the literal IT software. I mean that institutional software and that framework. And I know look, look watching some of your or reading some of your op-eds thus on you've got ideas about there are different models. Maybe the India model is different from the European model is different from the the US model and there's probably room for some you know, experimentation uh, and, and hybrid vigor uh, for a while. But, um, you know, it is, a, it is a really pressing kind of issue because if you look at, you know, I don't want to loop back to China, but some of the things that are going on, you know, in this space in the US, um, you know, have as totalitarian a flavor as some of the things that China might do. Um, 
you know, I don't want to get into Section 230 and its application, but it's pretty clear that, you know, the, the cards are being thrown up in the air and, and we just don't know yet where they're going to fall. All right. Um, thanks so much for that, uh, Paul. Uh, I'll um, segue to some of the questions that have been coming in, some for you and, and, and James. Uh, so, James, uh, here's, a, here's a softball one for you, uh, which is, um, is there any way to solve the caste politics problem uh, in India and how can India be more inclusive? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, <laughs> you were being ironic. I, I, I was. I mean, I, you know, people's, you know, I, I, you know, this is an outsider's view of India. You know, I've worked for 30 years in sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America. I'm not an expert on India. I've never done research in India. This is reading books about India. I think, you know, I would say, you know, if I was talking about Africa and, you know, people, let me talk about Africa instead, you know, and you'll see what the analogy is. You know, it, it's social scientists or people who don't know much about Africa talk about ethnicity the whole time. Like Africa is divided into these competing ethnic groups. Perhaps like outsiders who don't know much talk about how India is divided into these castes, you know. But in my, my experience of working in Africa, ethnic identities are there, but so are many other identities. You know, you may have a national identity, you may have a regional identity, you may have a clan identity, you may be part of a lineage group or a descent group, or you're a member of all sorts of associations and groups. Like, you know, I was talking about my friend's village in eastern Nigeria. You know, that there's so many identities there. Yeah, people are Igbo, you know, primarily if there's an ethnic identity, but there's many other sorts of identities too. And I guess India is like that as well. You know, in my experience, Africans are very flexible at kind of using different identities in different contexts. And ethnicity can be sort of triggered in some contexts, you know, and there are big political incentives to trigger ethnicity as a kind of identity of, yeah, we're all Igbo and there's, you know, there's 20 million of us or 50 million of us or however many there are. And you should all vote for me because we're all Igbo together, you know, but I think the reality of African life is not like that. And I guess if I knew more about India, you know, if I'd done the kind of work in India that I've done in Africa, perhaps I'd, I'd understand actually that's, you know, there's many, Indians have many identities and there's lots of scope for kind of reconfiguring the way people identify in in different ways and coming together across caste and and you know for caste withering away and and you know so i don't know how that would how that would how that would work you know or what would bring that together you know whether that's you know i think that's probably very idiosyncratic i could talk about africa but but i kind of made the analogy just to say people have lots of identities and i could easily you know could i imagine a scenario where caste disappeared and, and Indians related to each other in a different way, which was more compatible with having an inclusive society. And yes, I can, I can imagine that, you know, what, 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 would, what would it take for that to happen? I, I, you need to know more about India than I do. Well, I, I think, uh, I, I think you're uh, being somewhat modest here, James, uh, your uh, chapter on India to me reflected quite a deep understanding of Bihar politics and, and all of that. So, um, I, I think I think you're taking the road of answering a simpler question, <laughs> which is which is fair enough. Um, but you know, I I, I, I guess the, your, your broader point is that there are other identities that can sort of dominate the the caste politics identity, and that's fair. Um, and 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 maybe digitalization will uh, sort of accelerate this um, you know progression of new identities. Um, yeah, or, or maybe maybe it just allows people to watch President Modi doing his yoga video. And <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. Uh, I don't know. Knowing India, I, 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 I would guess that it'll go in in multiple directions as opposed to just sort of watching Modi doing his uh, yoga asans. Um, so, Paul, uh, there was a, a very different kind of question for you, uh, which had to do with sort of, um, you know, the fact that English is, uh, you know, a, a very, you know, one of the primary languages in India and whether you, you, you view that as, uh, you know, as an advantage uh, 
uh, or a disadvantage uh, in that it leads to a lack of sort of local collaboration and human resource utilization. And it's sort of related to what James was just talking about, right? My identity as a Bengali or a Tamilian or whatever, right? There, there, there are all these, you know, did, uh, so how do you, how do you think about this, the, the role of language uh, in India and sp specifically English? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what thinks of Vasan. I'm not sure exactly what the argument is that actually having English as a kind of quasi national language and certainly you know the language of the educated elites who can then seamlessly uh, you know kind of move into the global economy. I haven't really thought about that argument that that actually has a negative side, which sort of somehow um, is a barrier to better. Kind of linguistic integration internally within India, but I mean, by and large, I mean, I've always thought of it as an as, as an advantage. Of course, it's you know, it's difficult to think of the counterfactual, um, <clears throat> and I think there are many languages you know, other than Hindi in in the Indian subcontinent. But if you did run the sub the the, the um, uh, counterfactual would be well, if if you know if, if if India never had the English language as a kind of uh, lingua franca that they could use then very very uh, easily internationally, what would its economic development have looked like to date? Now, if you use the China counter you know, sort of example as a as a guide to that, you might say, well, China didn't have English; it just had you know Chinese, and again, different dialects of Chinese. And the Chinese script is very different from the English script. So there was no leg up in terms of, 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 of acquiring uh, English capability. And that hasn't held the Chinese economy back in terms of its growth rate in the last you know, 40 years now. Um, so it's, you know, it's, again, it's very difficult to kind of ponder these counterfactuals. But I, I do think that, again, you know, I've mentioned the, the diaspora before. Um, and again, you, you you could potentially make the argument that the fact that the educated elites in, in India, it's so easy for them to uh, move to the US and work for these high tech firms and consulting firms and, and, and whatever and be entrepreneurs, that's a brain drain to it to India. And that's facilitated by you know, having the English language uh, as that lingua franca. So you can make all sorts of arguments, but I would, you know, I would, you know, it is what it is at the moment, and I think it is an asset that India can uh, can usefully uh, leverage. So um, let's uh, thanks for that, Paul. Um, let's just end with a question that that just came in, which is, and this is for both of you. Um, and the question is that China may or may not sort of end up with a bang or a crash, but it's certainly embracing a growth retarding strategy by focusing on non economic issues such as demarcation of the border all the way to Taiwan, forcing minorities to embrace uh, you know, the CCP's view of the country. So the question from, from this sort of um, uh, narrative is, what's the lesson for Indian economy and the rise in identity politics? Okay, well, I will I go first. That's a tricky one. Maybe I'll go first and give the last word to uh, to James. Um, it's 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 a really kind of difficult uh, difficult question. I mean, just maybe picking up, you know, can come back and put a bow on my my thoughts on on, on China. Um, you know, I certainly wouldn't sit here as as somebody who would like you know be a China apologist or you know anything like that. But you know, somebody as a global economist that's looked at the global economy for many years and you know has observed the rise of China. Um, you do have to, you know you I think you do have to sort of look at it in, and, and, and a little bit on their terms. I used to send the, the term social contract before. Maybe that was a little bit lazy intellectually. I, I think the system has operated as if there is some kind of social contract between the population and the, the ruling class. Uh, I don't think it's right to look at China as this, you know, I mean, you often hear like Xi Jinping as this dictator. You know, he's the top of this 90 million person internal political labor market and tournament, and he got to the top. And, and I think, you know, that the leaders and the leadership in China are very attuned to, um, yes, they probably like their political power, but they're very attuned to the idea that their, one of their main mission is on the economic side, that's my obviously area, on 
delivering and securing economic development and doing sort of what it takes, what they think it takes to do that. On the military, the geopolitical side, that's a whole different kind of conversation. But I, I do think, you know, and we're having all sorts of things going on, you know, recently, just yesterday, this, uh, uh, this new Australia uh, UK US development with nuclear submarine technology. And then, of course, we have the Quad meeting uh, in Washington as we speak today. That is India, the, India, Japan, the US, and Australia. Um, so, if, you know, if, if, if you're sitting in China and looking at the world, I think their mindset is very much one of saying, um, you know, the US is no longer the global hegemon, the global policeman. And, and if I think the message of, you know, both the Trump and the Biden administrations has really been the direction has been, say, as America has to pull back and redefine its role in, in sort of global security. And, you know, it makes sense that you know, China should also kind of step up and have more, more responsibility, burden sharing, if you like. So I think that the, the topic for, the, for the, the global economy from the geopolitical, the geosecurity point of view is with the rise of China in particular, and U.S. is a kind of relatively declining power in relative terms, not absolute terms necessarily or at all. There needs to be some kind of new reaccommodation of those two powers, those two great powers. And then, of course, everybody around that, the Indias, the Australias, the Japans, the UKs, you know, have got to find their place in that, in that as well. Um, so that's just broad brush stuff. You know, you mentioned... Um, identity politics. <laughs> but again, we need a whole podcast on that. But, um, you know, again, this, if you look at what China's been doing recently, they are uh, kind of, you know, clamping down on some of this kind of unfettered social media. Um, and um, I don't think just China, I think if you look at Russia, for example, they have no appetite to go down the identity politics route. So I think some countries, I don't know what the sense is in India, that look at the identity politics as it's developing and developed in the West are really saying at the state level, if not the societal level, we don't really want to open this Pandora's box and go down that very divisive identity politics um, path. So I'll just leave it there. I'll be interested to hear what James has to say about this issue in particular. Yeah, That's well, my, my, my view, should I start talking? Yes, yes. Please. Yeah, my view is that, you know, politics is not really about economics. I mean, this is one of the things that I, I've sort of decided, you know, that economists tend to think that politics and this, you know, this is what's wrong with the academic study of political economy, because the academic study of political economy is like the politics behind economics. But actually, politics is not really about economics, mostly under some circumstances, it can be, you know, is Donald Trump, is that about economics? He can certainly tap into economic problems and economic marginalization and economic grievances. But I don't think make America great is about economics, actually. And I don't think, you know, Mr. Modi's strategy is about economics. And I don't think, you know, so President Xi, what does he think about when he wakes up in the morning? You know, does he think about the growth rate or he might worry about that kind of, you know, at 3 p.m. in the afternoon? I think he worries about how can he consolidate this personality cult he's creating. Now schools have to teach his thought. Uh, he abolished the term limits, you know, that Deng Xiaoping tried to institutionalize within the communist leadership. You know, he's building himself up into a kind of Mao-like figure, okay? Yeah, it's true. There's all these people competing with him. If they get too big, like Jack Ma, they disappear from public for a bit, you know, or they get taxed to oblivion. So that's what happened. You know, if you're in the Communist Party and you get too big for your boots, you get arrested and suddenly your hair goes white. Sorry, Basant. You know, yeah. <laughs> but in China, everyone's hair is black until they get arrested and then it goes white. You know, so I think, you know, if you look at the Cultural Revolution, what was the Cultural Revolution? The Cultural Revolution was exactly an attempt to get all these competitors in the Communist Party under control. And Mao did that by, by getting them to fight each other and unleashing you know, the red, the red guards against, you know, people like Deng Xiaoping and sending him off to a tractor factor, tractor factory in Inner in, in, in Mongolia or something. So I, I, you know, I don't see China as anything like as stable as, as, as you do. And I just think generally, you know, in Latin America, I've studied a lot, you know, you look at President Chavez, you know, was that, is, is politics about economics, you know, or Lopez Obrador in Mexico at the moment? I don't think politics is about economics. And I think like, 
And I don't understand. I think in some context, it can be about economics. Like, you know, when I grew up, when I was a student at the LSE, Mrs. Thatcher, you know, was in power. And I think Mrs. Thatcher, it was a rare moment where she sort of decided that if I emphasize all these economic things, it's actually consistent with my political goals. You know, what did she really want to do? She wanted to emasculate the trade union movement. She wanted to demolish the social basis of the Labour Party and create a political transition. And it just so happened that that coincided with particular sorts of economic policies freeing the market, which I don't think she really cared about, but she saw that it was consistent with her political goals. If you look at the Pinochet dictatorship, it's another great example of that. You know, when General Pinochet came to power in Chile in 1973, he didn't have an economic policy. He just wanted to get rid of these people he thought were communists and kind of roll back communism and get the unions under control and kind of emasculate socialism in Chile. How did he do that? Well, he did that by murdering thousands of people and firing 50,000 people from their jobs and imprisoning tens of thousands, of course, the usual sort of stuff. But then he also realized that these free market economic policies would actually destroy many of the bases for political opposition to him. So he embraced free market economics. So, you know, I, that's the way I think about politics. Politicians don't think about e economics, you know, except marginally. You know, it can jeopardize their power or authority. But it's only a small part of what politics is about, I would say. And I'm sure that's the way Mr. Modi thinks. So uh, we have a few minutes left and a question just came in. I, I think I already know the answer to this because we talked about it in our part. Um, so uh, and the question is, what's the role of religion in enhancing or retarding economic prosperity? You touched on the caste system, but this one is touching on religion. And you and I talked about sort of Hinduism versus Islam and all that kind of stuff. So uh, do, do you want to take this uh, before we wrap up, James? Yeah, I mean, that's a fascinating question. I mean, I, I, you know, I think Paul also, I like Paul, Paul's discussion about English. I think that's all, you know, that's not, I think that's also a fascinating, what is in uh, speaking English, is that an advantage for India or a disadvantage? I, I think he's absolutely right. There's lots of mechanisms, but there's no good social scientific research on that. And I think it, religion is sort of the same. You know, you can think that, you know, religion having a religion in common, you know, creates incentives. You know, think about the Ten Commandments. You know, like one view of world history is that, you know, people emphasize a lot the Neolithic Revolution and the transition to agriculture 10,000 BC, but nothing really happens after that, you know, for 9,000 years or whatever it is. Things start happening when big modern ethical systems emerge. And some of those are religion. Some of those are religious, you know, the old, the, tr the prophets of the Old Testament, you know, or thou shalt not kill, you know, they're sort of rules and rules come out of religion. Of course, some of them are very secular. You could say Confucius also produced a system of rules, but that was a very secular system. So I don't think religion is necessarily connected to institutions, but in some contexts, clearly it is, and it's a source of institutions, and it can be a source of homogeneous institutions also, you know, which creates inclusion where everyone is treated the same. You know, you could say Islam is like that. You know, Islam is a great source of inclusion in the sense that there's a set of rules. It applies to everyone. There's kind of equality, you know, and, and so, so I, I find religion sort of fascinating, but I don't think there's very much good social science evidence one way or the other for for its role. I think you see these societies, you know, like think about Japan, you know, Japan, there's no kind of centralized Western style religion in Japan. You know, everyone's a god. You know, it's sort of, it's, you know, it's very hard to put your hands on religion in, in, in Japan. And, you know, but they succeeded, you know, where other places, you know, with Christianity succeeded or, you know, or I don't know, like, so I, I, I it's very hard to get what the evidence is on that question. All right. Uh, thanks for that, James. Uh, but, but Paul, can, and, yes. Yeah, please. No, just, go ahead. I mean, just just maybe to tie a bow on that, because because James mentioned Japan, where I lived for many years um, and mentioned the Shinto religion. The, the sort of joke in Japan is that uh, Japanese are born into Shintoism. They marry as Christians and they die as Buddhists. Um, but I just uh, just maybe two other further comments. Um, so that's sort of the eclectic nature of, of religion. But I think James is, is 
is very right that obviously you know religion uh, feeds into moral and legal kind of codes it also feed and it feeds into kind of like what is your belief about the meaning of life and your place in the universe and you know i'm sure that you could probably make some argument that depending on the nature of 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 that of those respective systems that may reflect itself in different kinds of mindsets and that may feed into kind of social capital in a way uh, as well which is uh, uh, you know i think an important ingredient again we've talked about institutions and markets and the state etc um but the formation of, of social capital and how that social capital helps to drive growth and prosperity i think is another way of looking at this this whole thing but um yeah it's a, it's a again another podcast i think but maybe with a different panelist in my case for religion <laughs> indeed yeah no you know my 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 i guess my summary answer to that would have been you know that it depends on whether it how it's practiced and whether it pushes you into the corridor or out of it so on that note uh james and paul thank you so much for uh being on this uh session it's been a fascinating conversation i certainly enjoyed it and i hope everyone out there did as well thank you all for tuning in thank thanks you. again thank you thank you